Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me now? Great. <clears throat> well, thanks so much, and welcome. Thanks so much for coming, and welcome to the event this evening, uh, entitled "Originalism and Its Discontents." Um, my name is Stephanie Lindquist. I am a professor of law here at ASU, and also serve as the executive director for the new Center for Constitutional Design uh, here in the law school. We're a brand new center. We've been open less than a year. And we are funded generously by the Lodestar Foundation, who we'd like to thank as well. Our mission at the center is to explore issues of constitutional design with a particular focus on comparing the US Constitution to other national constitutions to gain insight and to promote conversations about the most effective uh, me methods of constitutional design to promote uh, democracy and civic welfare. This, event, this evening's event, uh, event was, of course, prompted by decisions rendered uh, by, the U by the U.S. Supreme Court in the most recent term. In many of the court's constitutional decisions, we saw the court's conservative majority turn to an increasingly robust interpretive methodology based on originalism, which is a method of constitutional interpre interpretation grounded in original understandings of the document by the people at the time of the ratification of the Constitution or of the amendments. This is what I've called elsewhere originalism on steroids. Um, and this, methodolo this methodology will continue, I think, to dominate the majority's approach to interpretation for years to come. So this conversation is extremely timely and extremely important for the future. We've asked a distinguished panel of scholars and jurists to come together to discuss, one, the meaning of originalism and how the interpret interpretive methodology actually works, two, whether originalism should become the dominant method for interpreting the Constitution, and three, whether originalism can fulfill its advocates' claims that it ensures judicial restraint. So we are joined by a panel of three distinguished professors and one distinguished jurist to discuss these issues. Um, their full biographies um, of all of our panelists are available on the Center for Constitutional Do Design's website, which is constitutionaldesign.asu.edu. On your tables, you'll see cards that have, uh, obviously, our website, but also some descriptions some of our upcoming events, which I encourage you to take a look at, they're open to the public. In fact, there's one next week about federalism and elections I encourage you to come to. Um, so I'm not going to go over the biographies because, frankly, these folks are so distinguished, um, it could take the entire hour and a half. I think it's better simply to refer you to the biographies on the website. But let me begin by um, in introducing the speakers. Um, first, our first speaker will be Justice Clint Bullock of the Arizona Supreme Court. Um, Justice um, for taking the time to join us this evening, and thank you for your continued support to ASU Law School as well. Thank you very, very much for that. Our second speaker will be Professor Elon Wer Werman, who serves as Associate Professor of Law here at ASU. He's uh, become widely known in professional circles as a defendant, or uh, sorry, not a defendant. <laughs> as <laughs> Usually I'm the plaintiff. <laughs> for, 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 his, for his passionate defense of originalism, and he's written a book recently on the topic. Third, we will hear from Professor Jim Weinstein, who serves as the Dan Crocciolo Chair in Constitutional Law and is internationally known and respected scholar of the First Amendment, among other things. And I want to thank Jim in particular for the idea for this, for this panel. So we have Jim to thank. Jim, thank you for bringing us together. I also want to note that Jim has some back issues, so if he gets up and wanders around during the panel, please don't be offended, panelists or members of the audience. So, uh, <laughs> or conceding. <laughs> And finally, I want to introduce Professor DeMarniff. Um, he serves as Professor of Philosophy in ASU School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. So we're so pleased to have all of you here with us. Each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes. And I think we have a timer, Carol. Great, OK, in the back. Um, so we'd like to keep track of the time so that we ensure that we have time at the end uh, for Q&A from the audience. Um, the first two speakers will explain this is uh, Justice Bullock, and uh, Professor Werman will explain the framework of originalist interpretation. They will be followed by uh, Professor Weinstein, who will discuss the discontents uh, mm -hmm. of the title of our presentation here. And finally, Professor DeMarniff will synthesize and critique the approaches and offer an alternative perspective from philosophy. So this, this I think, promises to be a very interesting discussion. Um, so again, we'll have a timer in the, in the front row. There is a standing microphone at the back of the room, so when the, uh, when the um, presentations are concluded, we're going to ask the audience to please you know, move to the, to the microphone if you have a question for the group. And I'll moderate that. And we'll try to finish up uh, sometime before 7.30, uh, again, respectful of your time. So 
Um, having said that, um, I will turn uh, the podium over, or not the podium, but the microphone. Uh, over to Professor Bullock and thank you, or, or to Justice Bullock and thank you again for. <coughs> well, you are a professor and too. Professor, yeah. Yeah. So he also professes at Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, um, good evening, everybody. It's really great to see you. Um, I want to introduce my my esteemed colleague, Justice Bill Montgomery. Um, I could not be happier to be on the uh, the court that I am, and it's my colleagues who make the experience amazing, and those of you who don't know him, I hope you'll uh, introduce yourselves tonight um, and, and get to know him. I am also delighted um, to see so many former students, former interns, current students, current clerks, current interns, future clerks, mm -hmm. uh, and clerks of other justices who are here tonight. Um, boy, if you don't get enough of me during the day, it's just... Uh, <laughs> Amazing to me. Uh, what an honor and delight to be the first speaker on the first panel hosted by the ASU Law School Center for Constitutional Design. And speaking on the topic of originalism and its discontents, I am mindful of the fact that if my remarks make the audience discontented enough, I may also be the last speaker uh, <laughs> for the center. Uh, so I'll try to keep my remarks moderate enough to quell any uh, discontent. Seriously, though, I am excited about the center, about this topic, about having such an amazing turnout and an evening event, uh, about being part of such a distinguished panel, and above all, about being able to drink wine at the law school without having to commit an act of civil disobedience. <laughs> um, several years ago, my wife Shauna was watching Justice Gorsuch's confirmation hearings where he remarked that a judge who agrees with all of his own opinions is probably not a very good judge, which caused her to come running into the next room to tell me, Gorsuch sounds just like you. <laughs> Gorsuch was right. For an originalist, there is no better day than one in which you vote against a policy that you strongly support, because it means that you exalt the rule of law above your own policy preferences. And that is one of the qualities that distinguishes true originalists from many non-originalists. In the heyday of the Warren Court and its conception of a living constitution, one would be hard pressed to identify many or even any cases whose outcomes differed from the world view of the justices deciding them. But for a true originalist, it happens frequently. I can only imagine how difficult it was for Justice Antonin Scalia, surely one of the most patriotic people to ever serve on the Supreme Court, to cast the deciding vote in Texas versus Johnson, holding that uh, flag desecration was protected by the First Amendment. We need such justices to ensure that the rule of law and our precious liberties will endure. I view the question of constitutional interpretation from a different perspective from my co-panelist because as a judge, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Perhaps it is a failure of imagination, but I just don't know how to do that other than figuring out what its words mean and applying them. And that is my definition of an originalist, one who interprets the Constitution and statutes according to the plain meaning of the terms as they were understood when adopted. Of course, that methodology does not settle every dispute, but in my view, judges should always start there and end there whenever possible. Every other method of interpretation is some form of philosopher kingism. Our appointment as judges does not authorize us to make up the law. Our Constitution's framers recognize that times change and that sometimes our Constitution must change as well. That is why they specified ways to amend the Constitution. Last time I looked, constitutional modification by judicial fiat was not among them. So, for example, we do not have license to change the meaning of public use in the Fifth Amendment to public benefit. We do not have authority to transform the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishments into cruel or unusual punishments. At the same time, contrary to Robert Bork's assertion, 
There are no ink blots in the Constitution. It is our job to give every word its intended meaning. Originalism is hard work, and originalists often have good faith disagreements. A great example is the Second Amendment case, District of Columbia versus Heller. For my part, I am not fully persuaded that the majority opinion sufficiently credits the preambular language about militias. But both the majority and dissenting opinions do a good job in arguing what the language means, which is the court's proper focus. I like originalism because it is a discipline both in the sense that it involves a set of rules and imposes constraints on subjective value-laden determinations. As my court has grown more originalist, our conversations increasingly have focused on the meaning of language. Fortunately, in addition to canons of interpretation, we have new tools at our disposal, such as corpus linguistics, which is a massive database of words and phrases in common usage at any moment in time. We released an opinion yesterday in Burns versus APS, which I hope provides a good example of applied originalism. The issue was whether our constitutional provision that in provides investigatory powers to the Corporation Commission and the several members thereof allows a majority of commissioners to quash a subpoena issued by one commissioner. Though the question might appear relatively simple on its face, it presented a complex constitutional issue. And indeed, the Court of Appeals concluded that a different constitutional provision empowered the commission to quash the subpoena. In determining that the commission violated the individual commissioner's constitutional rights, we examined the di dictionary definition of several from 1912 when our constitution was adopted the punctuation used in the provision, the omission of similar language in other provisions of the article, and the canon that we will not render any language superfluous. My favorite passage is that we quote, do not read separate constitutional provisions to determine which prevails over the other. Rather, we read them to harmonize the provisions and give effect to each, end quote. This exercise underscores that although originalism is emphatically not sexy stuff, it is serious stuff. By contrast, I try to imagine what the US Supreme Court would have been like when Justices Scalia and Kennedy served together. I can picture Scalia slapping his forehead and asking in exasperation, Tony, where do you get these ideas? And Kennedy, equally frustrating, frustrated, replying, Nino, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. It's in the 14th Amendment's Mysteries of the Cosmos language. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads to another attribute of originalism. It transcends partisan lines. Both Scalia and Kennedy were appointed by Ronald Reagan. Yet Justice Elena Kagan is far more faithful to originalism than Kennedy ever was or purported to be. Scalia is heir to Justice Hugo Black. Kennedy is heir to Justice William Douglas. And indeed, when I joined my court in, in 2016, Chief Justice Scott Bales, who was considered the most liberal justice at the time, told me that the first thing I had to do was to purchase Scalia and Garner's book, Reading Law, which I did. Apart from perhaps from Justice King's 1912 dictionary down the hall, it is the resource I use most in deciphering the law. Certainly, the US Supreme Court's originalism scorecard and that of individual justices is uneven. Substantive due process, which was the creation of a conservative court over a century ago, became the canvas for many a fevered and unbounded judicial imagination. By contrast, equal protection cases proceeding from Yick Woe versus Hopkins to Justice Harlan's Plessy dissent, Brown versus Board of Education, Loving versus Virginia, Romer versus Evans, and Justice O'Connor's concurring opinion in Lawrence versus Texas have largely followed a more originalist path. I can only hope, and I suspect that Professor Werman agrees with me, that one day the court will give us back the privileges or immunities clause.
Yet originalism surely has its critics. One feature that distinguishes most, <coughs> if not all, of originalism's discontents is they spend a lot more time critiquing originalism than presenting a coherent alternative and justifying it from the perspective of a justice's or a judge's sacred oath. They also love to play the gotcha game, which consists of identifying what they perceive as an undesirable result of originalism and are attempting to discredit originalism on that basis. My friend Professor Weinstein knows my passion for freedom of speech, and in fact, we collaborated on a successful free speech case a few years ago. He recently introduced me to a provocative theory that the First Amendment protects not freedom of speech as the courts have construed it for 100 years, but the freedom of speech, which they contend was a much narrower term of art in 1787. A true originalist, Professor Weinstein has argued to me, would have to apply that much narrower meaning. And because such a result is unthinkable, we need to discard originalism and embrace a more flexible or realist or whatever adjective de jour mode of constitutional interpretation gives us the result we prefer. I have no idea what to think about this theory, which for now appears confined to the academic ivory tower. Were I convinced that we have misapprehended freedom of speech for the past century, then I would reluctantly apply its narrower original meaning. I feel myself oath bound to do so. Happily, that would only lead me to indulge my twin constitutional passion to originalism which is state constitutionalism. And as our Declaration of Rights proclaims in Article 2, Section 6, and I quote, every person may freely speak, write, and publish on all subjects being responsible for the abuse of that right. And an originalist dream, right? I do want to express two concerns about some strands of originalism. First, I am concerned over the increasing focus on history and tradition in terms of defining constitutional provisions. History and tradition are not law. The words of the Constitution are. And history and tradition lend themselves to the type of subjectivity that originalism tries to avoid. Second is the emergence of thematic originalism, specifically a school of thought called common good originalism that elevates perceived constitutional values over constitutional provisions. Still, I think about originalism in much the same way as Churchill thought about democracy. It is the worst system, except for all the rest. Those who wish to convince me that my oath means something other than enforcing the original plain meaning of constitutional and statutory language bear a very high burden. Let's see if originalism's tis discontents can meet that stiff challenge. Thank you so much for being here tonight and for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Go ahead. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm not sure which part of the title I actually belong to, the originalism <laughs> or the discontent, because I'm sort of the discontented originalist. I think the Supreme Court could use more steroids if it wants to. So originalism on more steroids. And I think if, in fact, they were more originalist, uh, I think their decisions would be better and actually maybe less predictable. Because right now, I think, you know, and, and to their credit, you know, they're bound by 150 years of erroneous precedent that they didn't set. The slaughterhouse cases, which Justice Bullock alluded to. But uh, I think uh, it allows them, by not revisiting the Privileges or Immunities Clause, uh, to be more conservative than actually originalist. And I'll, I'll unpack that uh, maybe in the second half of what I wanted to say. But So let me just back up and start with a, a bit of framing. Uh, so I'm going to kind of just describe sort of originalism as academics uh, uh, conceive of it or perceive of it. And so I think just as a def definition, right, what is originalism, right? Originalism stands for this proposition that we should follow the original meaning of the Constitution, right? The meaning its words would have had to the people who, uh, the drafters who wrote it and the public that ratified it. But I actually think originalism is a much more fundamental idea. It is the idea that there are distinctions 
between what the law is, what the law ought to be, and whether the law is nevertheless binding. Okay, here's what I mean. This is actually how we think of other legal instruments in our system. Contracts, statutes, treaties. Ordinarily, we first ask, okay, what does this contract actually say? What does this statute actually do? What does it mean? What legal effect does it have? Now, once we figure that out, it may turn out that we entered into a bad business deal. We entered into a bad contract. Or maybe Congress, perhaps not so surprisingly, enacted a bad law. Right, but very much an integral part of our legal system is that we are nevertheless bound by the contracts that we've properly entered into, just as we're bound by Congress's bad laws. Why is that? When you actually think about it, like, why are we bound by Congress's bad laws? Well, because in our system, okay, we maintain that so long as the laws are enacted pursuant to a particular democratic process, two houses of Congress, a nationally representative president, that process is sufficient to confer legitimacy on the laws such that they are binding, irrespective of what they mean and whether you agree with what they mean. The laws as a whole are binding. My point is there is a difference between what a law says and means and does from whether that law is binding and enforceable. These are distinct questions. Well, the Constitution is also a law, like a contract or statute or treaty, right? So I think the originalist position is that we should first ask, what is this Constitution actually say? What does it do? What kind of constitutional regime does it create? Now, it may turn out, once we you know, figure that out, that we don't like all of its provisions, or maybe it's imperfect, but is there an argument that we're nevertheless bound by this Constitution as a whole, despite any imperfections or any particular provisions we don't like, just as we're bound by the laws of Congress as a whole? Okay, so I think for the originalist, it really boils down to two questions. The first is, how do we figure out what this Constitution means and says and does? That's question one. And then question two is, once we figure that out, should we follow that Constitution now that we know what it means and says or does? These are two different inquiries, okay? And truly in a nutshell, okay, the first one I think is pretty obvious. I think the originalist position is we interpret the Constitution the same way we interpret any communication intended as a public instruction. Okay, so the example that I steal from Professor Gary Lawson is if you found um, uh, a, a recipe uh, for fried chicken in your great, 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 great grandparents' attic that you carbon dated, carbon dated to 1789, it was written in Philadelphia, how would you interpret this recipe, right? Well, you'd use a public meaning, right? Not a secret meaning, not an esoteric meaning, not a poetic meaning, okay? This recipe is a set of instructions. It's not a Socratic dialogue, okay? It's not a poem. It's not a novel. So you interpret it with a public meaning and with the original meaning, the meaning the creator of the recipe intended to convey at the time it was written, okay? That's not to deny the existence of interpretive, difficult, interpretive difficulties and so on, but, and lower order disagreements, as Justice Bullock mentioned, but, but that's how you would interpret that document. Well, the Constitution is also a public instruction. It's a public instruction from we the people to our legal officials. It's not a poem, notwithstanding what Justice Kennedy sometimes liked to think about the 40th Amendment. It's not, it's a, it actually is a set of relatively detailed instructions. Okay, so I think we interpret it the same way, you, you know, with a public meaning and with original meaning. That doesn't answer the question, okay, whether that constitution should be followed. That is a separate question, okay? The de and I wanna be clear about something. Even in a non-originalist system, something is going to get its original public meaning. What? The PDF files that the justices of the US, US Supreme Court post on the internet every Monday and Thursday. When they pronounce a judgment and give reasoning, how do you read the opinions that they read? You don't say, well, are they being Socratic? Are they being ironic? Are they being poetic? Right, when a police officer says, stop doing X, Y, or Z, you don't say, well, are you, you know, are you, composing a novel? Like, no, you're giving a set of instructions. Okay, that's what lawgivers do. That's what law does. That's what its purpose is. Okay, so we're, the question isn't whether we interpret some document or other with its original public meaning. We will. The question is where does our law come from? What determines the content of our constitutional law? The paper under the glass of the National Archives? or the PDF files that the justices post every Monday and Thursday, even if it diverges? That is a normative question 
that can only be answered you know, by we the people today. Right? If we the people today, as a matter of uh, what, Hardian social facts, I'm not going to unpack that, but you look up HLA Hart if you want. As a matter of present day social facts, believe and agree and accept that our Constitution should continue to be this fundamental law, then that's the law we'll follow. Now, that doesn't stop us from debating over whether it should be. And I have a book and I argue, you know, what are the criteria that make a constitution legitimate and binding? It's this threshold balance of self-government and liberty. I have no time to talk about this right now, but that's the question. It's a normative question whether, and I guess here's something I'll say before moving on to the second smaller half of my talk, okay? Which is something must make a constitution binding. Okay, it's not true that a constitution can never be binding. That's not true anywhere, okay? But it can't be the case that the constitution's only binding if it says exactly what you personally would want it to say. That can't be true either. 300 million Americans can have a different view of that. Something must make a constitution legitimate and therefore binding, despite the inevitable disagreements that people might have over its particulars. Okay? That something is this threshold balance of self-government and liberty. Yes, we have to agree on that, and, and maybe people disagree that that's the criteria or that we've met the criteria, fine, but that's a normative question. It is not a question of whether texts, legal texts ordinarily are given their original public meaning. Okay, is the modern day, pause, okay? <laughs> Any questions? That's, that's what I would say <laughs> at that point. Is the modern court being original? Okay, everyone says that it's originalism on steroids, but I don't think they are because all the prominent cases, I really have pivoted relatively quickly, so you can segment this in your mind, okay? Uh, Bruin, the Second Amendment case, Dobbs, the abortion case, the two free exercise cases, even the administrative law stuff, which we won't have time to talk about. Uh, they were decided under this concept of substantive due process. Substantive due process, okay, what is, what is substantive due process? I should have prepared something in writing, you know, and now I'm just talking. Okay. <laughs> the due process, this is the key to all modern constitutional litigation for the most part, okay, rights litigation. There's a clause that says, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What does this sound like? It sounds like the state can, in fact, take away your life, your liberty, and your property, as long as it gives due process of law. What's due process of law? It's, there must be law that you violate, okay? They can't just say, you know, Justice Bullock, you know, we don't like the way you look today, go to the Tower of London. You, know, you can't do that. There must be some law that's established in advance that you violate, and your violation of that law is adjudicated according to fundamental procedures, or at least procedures known to the law, okay? Substantive due process is the idea. Substance process, you see oxymoron contradiction already. It's this idea that the due process clause also has a substantive restriction on legislative power. Right? That, to, that there are some substantive, moral, normative criteria without which an act of Congress wouldn't be law for purposes of due process of law. That there's unwritten substantive limits on state legislative power. This is totally bogus, totally made up. There are some scholars, a lot of scholars who don't agree with me about this. They're wrong, whatever, you can read about it. <laughs> you can read my book, my, my newest book about uh, the 14th Amendment. Uh, but in any event, uh, it's widely, widely agreed that this is a made up concept, okay. In Dobbs overturning uh, uh, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade was a substantive due process decision. Did Dobbs reject substantive due process? No, they didn't. The court just said, if we're going to do substantive due process, we're just gonna limit the fundamental rights that a state can't infringe, right, to those deeply rooted in history and tradition, okay. Uh, Bruin, the Second Amendment, and the free exercise cases, okay, the Bill of Rights, didn't apply to the states historically. It only does so through the 14th Amendment, through subs this idea of substantive due process. Okay? All of these are 14th Amendment cases. They're not First Amendment cases, they're not Second Amendment cases, I mean, Dobbs unenumerated rights. But the court doesn't grapple okay, with this. Now, that's not to say the outcomes are wrong. Why? Because there is another clause, which was supposed to be the crown jewel of the 14th Amendment that was written out by the, by the Supreme Court in 1873 in Slaughterhouse, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and it says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Okay, this could have a, a few possible meanings. Maybe this is what incorporates the Bill of Rights. Right? What are the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens? Ah, oh, the Bill of Rights, it defines them. You know, and a state can't abridge them. Maybe it's all fundamental rights, right? And then maybe the inquiry is the same. Right? Or maybe, as I've argued, and everyone disagrees with me about this, but I have the virtue at least of being correct, 
even if I'm alone, a scholarly, a, 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 you know, alone here as a scholar. Uh, it's an equality provision, right? States can widely have widely a way to define and regulate all civil rights, contract, property, gun rights, okay, speech rights, uh, free exercise rights, public benefits, as long as they don't discriminate, right? The distinction is the states can regulate the content of the right, but they can't abridge a right. What is an abridgment, an arbitrary denial of that right, however defined, to a group of people. How do we know what's an abridgment, right? Whether the purported regulation is reasonably related to the purpose of the right. Okay, this is too much detail I'm seeing now. Um, uh -huh. But like the black codes, historic example, okay? Uh, where you know the newly freed people in the South weren't allowed to enter into contracts, own property. Why is this an abridgment and not defining contract rights or defining property rights? Because skin color has nothing to do with the purpose of property rights or contract rights. Right? Think of like saying a law that says gays can't own property. Okay, I know I'm out of time. With the permission of the court, I'll finish my thought. Um, uh, a, a, a law that says you know gays can't own property. It doesn't matter if gays are a protected class or not, or a suspect class, or strict scrutiny. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Being gay has absolutely no relevance to the purpose of property rights or contract rights, and so it's an abridgment and not a regulation, sort of, of the right. Okay, so this is how it would work. Okay. How does Bruin come out? Well, I don't think the Second Amendment's necessarily incorporated. And Bruin might be, come out correctly anyway because the licensing scheme was so broad that it basically just allowed rich people and politicians to have guns, right? That sounds like an abridgment. Sounds like caste legislation, right? A rich, one code for rich people, one code for poor people, right? How would the First Amendment stuff come out in corporation? Well, you know, uh, if this, what are the privileges and immunities of citizens, these rights that all free governments uh, must secure, right? Political speech, sure. Political speech, sure. But flag burning, right? Uh, advertising violent video games to minors, protesting at a dead soldier's funeral, student speech, stealing valor, animal crush videos. These are six things that the United States Supreme Court has, has ruled on as a matter of the National First Amendment, applied it statewide. Is it true that all states, as a matter of the privileges and immunities of citizens, all free governments must have the same answer to whether we can prohibit advertising of violent video games to minors and the viewing of animal crush videos? Not at all. I think incorporation would look much different and much better if the court were more originalist. Okay, and with that, I'll stop, and sorry that I said way too much. Jim? Thanks, Steph. <coughs> I... Um, <coughs> share with uh, originalism uh, the premise that the Constitution is law and not a warrant for judges to impose their policy preferences on the populace. Uh, uh, and in this regard, I point, as Justice Bullock does, to uh, Justice uh, uh, Kennedy and to Justice Douglas as those who seem to think that the Constitution is a Rorschach test for what they think is good and right and, um, uh, and stopping what they think is evil and unfair. Um, I disagree, however, that original, originalism, at least as I've seen it in practice, is the best way to try to assure that judges stay within their constitutionally prescribed lane. Under the brand of originalism championed um, by Justice Scalia and currently in vogue with the conservative majority of the United States Supreme Court, uh, the determinative inquiry is whether the specific activity claiming constitutional protection would have been understood by the ratifiers as coming within the scope of uh, the relevant constitutional text. Now maybe I um, uh, heard a little bit of um, discontent from Justice Bullock about the specificity and maybe we will see that there's maybe not a lot of distance between um, Justice Bullock's view and I. I should say, though, like Justice Bullock, I um, uh, tell my, or at least his wife's report of uh, Justice Gorsuch, Tim, I tell my students that when their constitutional interpretation differs, particularly when it conflicts with their policy preferences, then you know you're doing constitutional law, right? Both of you have had me uh, in class. That's, I always... Uh, uh, say that, um, and and I also share with uh, um, uh, uh, Justice Bullock that I would uh, uh, antipathy to philosopher kingism, or as 
uh, Learned Hand said that uh, he f would find it irksome to be um, uh, ruled by a bevy of platonic guardians. Um, but, uh, so, but last term, uh, a, a particular brand of originalism came to the fore in cases dealing with abortion, guns, and religious liberty. Uh, in a moment, I'll have a few words to say about that. But first, taking uh, uh, Justice Bullock's um, uh, challenge uh, and using free speech as an example, I want to defend an alternative method of constitutional interpretation that I think is superior to the current brand of originalism. And I should say um, that I thought that, that Justice Bullock re, uh, um, uh, reported my challenge to him um, accurately, except that I, I didn't say that I would replace um, uh, originalism or textualism with some kind of legal realism. Um, in some sense, maybe the theory, my alternative theory is in some sense quite um, uh, originalistic in its uh, uh, self. But, all right, going, turning to the First Amendment, um, there was no consensus among those who ratified the First Amendment about what specifically the uh, freedom of speech entailed. Rather, there was a spectrum of views ranging from a very narrow view that maybe had the most uh, support that the prohibition was only against prior restraints on speech. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court thought that that was the case, said it was the case uh, uh, in 1908, I believe it was, and began to change its mind uh, in uh, Holmes's uh, famous uh, Schenker. Uh, that there was general agreement that the core purpose of the First Amendment included uh, at least uh, as a way of promoting representative democracy established by the Constitution. Beginning in the 1930s and before then in some famous dissenting opinions, developed doctrine to protect the right of Americans to safely participate in democratic self-governance governance by expressing their views on matters of public concern. In so doing, though, the court sensibly focused on what protection was necessary in contemporary America, not in 1791. Now, so, but this, I'm not, this is not legal realism. This is grounded in uh, the uh, uh, core meaning of, of an original understanding. It's just not slavishly looking for some uh, specific historical uh, um, um, understanding. All right, now let's go on a little bit. Now, I'm glad to say more about this uh, uh, theory. Um, oh, I should say this much. I'm not saying that, uh, and I, I wasn't urging a, a, a Justice Bullock to overrule everything that doesn't could be. I mean, there is another value, and that is precedent and, uh, um, and the stability of the court. So even though uh, much of our First Amendment um, um, uh, doctrine is not originalist in the way that this court does originalism, uh, that's not uh, reason uh, to overrule. There is that uh, consider very important consideration uh, uh, as well. Now, which brings us to the famous overruling, or infamous overruling, depending on your view, of uh, Roe and Wade in uh, Dobbs versus uh, uh, J uh, Jackson Women's Health Organization. In that case, the court um, overruled Roe uh, primarily on the grounds that a right to abortion was not recognized, that specific activity was not recognized in the Anglo-American tradition uh, from beginning in the Middle Ages and uh, going all the way up to uh, the day Roe was decided. They did a pretty good job of showing that. And for this reason, uh, uh, according to the majority, Roe's recognizing a constitutional right to abortion was not just wrong, but was egregiously wrong. And it was this finding of egregiousness by, in which the court pinned its, uh, primarily justified its overruling uh, of Roe. Now, uh, judicial, I agree with uh, 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 Alon here, uh, uh, Professor Worman here, that uh, a, a judicial, um, uh, judicial uh, um, uh, recognition of, uh, of uh, unenumerated constitutional rights uh, uh, by invoking that judicial 
uh, that, that jurisprudential oxymoron called substantive due process is really problematic. Uh, so I'm sympathetic to uh, um, means that would in the future um, closely confine, if not eliminate the ability of the judiciary to uh, create these uh, enumerated rights under that um, oxymoron. Uh, but the, the going back to precedent, but, be, but before and subsequent to Roe, the court recognized other substantive due process rights that did not have a, a, an historical pedigree, uh, including the right to contraception, uh, to engage in homosexual conduct, uh, to same-sex marriage, uh, none of which uh, equally devoid of constitutional pedigree. The court in Dobbs, however, makes no effort to explain how Roe was out of line with those other ahistorical findings. <laughs> well, um, I think that shows that even though Roe might be in some sense wrong, it certainly was not egregious, egregiously wrong if it fit in with that uh, a web of, uh, of jurisprudence. It was not some horrific outlier. And I don't know why the court pretended that it was. Um, so uh, once you, the, the underpinning of egregiously wrong falls, so, so does the court's primary justification for o overruling Roe. But um, OK, let me just, uh, a la uh, Ilan, finish the thought. And I won't get to the other, uh, other cases. But I wanted to show something about, uh, about what I, well, I, I think the court is doing uh, here. Um, by hiving off these other rights, despite their sharing of the lack of historical pedigree, the mo uh, um, ma majority seems to be uh, overruling, um, does not seem to be overruling uh, Roe because it was particularly offensive to originalism. Rather, it seems to me, the, the, the suspicion is certainly raised that they're doing so because the right to abortion recognized in Roe was contrary to these justices' personal policy preferences, or maybe even their religious preferences. Now, um, uh, I, I had something to say about uh, New York rifle and pistol, but um, uh, I will, uh, I'm out of time. And so I won't, uh, I won't do that uh, here. I'll do it later. I also had something to do, say, about the uh, originalism and in the, the uh, uh, praying coach case. But that will have, you have to ask me about that. <laughs> Thank you, Jim and Ilan and Clint, for your very interesting remarks. Um, at the uh, outset, uh, Stephanie asked three questions, and I'm going to answer them. Oh. <laughs> I completely forgot to answer them. So, originalism, what is it? Should we accept it? Does it entail judicial restraint? Uh, well, obviously, the answer to the question, should we accept it and does it entail judicial restraint, depends on what it is. And in fact, there are many different versions of originalism. So there's no real answer to what is it, because there are different versions of it. Different people defend different versions of it. Now, the, the, uh, Mine's the correct and true yeah, version. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, which is, I would add, a subjective judgment. Uh, Some of the subjective judgments right. are more true than others. Yes, right. So, but going back to what the way the way Clint defined it is that it, it directs us to interpret the Constitution in terms of the plain meaning of the terms when adopted. Um, now, that itself requires some interpretation. I want to just start with the judicial restraint question, and then if I have time, I'll have say something about the should we accept it question. As I understand it, Clint's formulation does not entail judicial restraint. So the idea that you get judicial restraint with originalism is an illusion. You get judicial restraint uh, with certain versions of originalism if you add certain premises that are disputed about what the words originally meant or how they're properly interpreted. So, um, and then, I mean, 
I think all three of uh, my co-panelists mentioned the boogeyman of philosopher kings as the thing that we don't want, which is the thing that somehow the Supreme Court has taken upon itself to be. So just, I mean, to, 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 to just be more precise, uh, they're not kings, uh, they're not philosophers, they're not selected the way the philosopher kings were selected in Plato's Republic. And, they do, and they're lawyers, and they, uh, they look at cases, they listen, to, uh, they listen to briefs, and they make their judgment about what the strongest argument is. That's, that's what they do. Now, does that, so what is the worry about philosopher kings? I take it the idea is that there's something objectionable about, as it's often said, nine elected justices deciding uh, controversial, controversial issues of public policy. Uh, when they're unelected and not subject to recall. So the idea is there's something fundamentally undemocratic about this system, about judicial review that is not restrained in a certain way. Okay, And so then the idea is that originalism, if properly followed, is supposed to provide the necessary restraint. But it doesn't, not as such. And the reason is that it, I mean, it's true that the Constitution is not a poetry, it's not a poem, but there are words in the Constitution that are not defined by the Constitution. Uh, that, and in some cases, as Jim pointed out, uh, words that didn't actually have an agreed upon meaning or a single meaning that everyone recognized. But let's take, a, let's take a, the, the example of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. So let's suppose that the Slaughterhouse court was incorrect in the slaughterhouse cases uh, and, in, 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 and that the minority in that case was right and that the uh, privileges or immunities clause protects the fundamental rights of U.S. citizens. And let's suppose that that includes freedom of speech and freedom of religion and some others. Well, there's no definition in the privileges or immunities clause of what rights are fundamental. So if the, if, what, if, the, if the original meaning of the Privileges and Immunities Clause was the United States government, Congress shall not abridge the, the fundamental rights, or sorry, states shall not abridge the fundamental rights of, uh, of U.S. citizens, now justices have to decide what the fundamental rights are. And there's no guidance in the text. There's no definition. There's nothing in the text that says it's limited to the Bill of Rights. There's nothing that, that says that it's limited to only some of the Bill of Rights. It says fundamental rights. It also doesn't say anything about what was thought to be fundamental rights in, uh, in 1868. So a conscientious judge who reads the Privileges or Immunities Clause, as I think Clint thinks it ought to be read, and maybe Ilan too, has to make a decision about what rights are fundamental. And they might well make the decision that the freedom to terminate a pregnancy is a fundamental right. There's nothing inconsistent with originalism with that view because there's nothing in the Constitution that identifies a list of fundamental rights. So there's no option to being, uh, for justices being philosopher kings in this particular sense. They have to rely on their moral judgment. To take another uh, example, the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel uh, and unusual punishments. Now, uh, that's not defined in the Constitution. And we can read history and we can try to figure out what people meant by it. But first of all, any, any, uh, any opinion about that, um, unless it supposes that the phrase is identical with a specific list of punishments, such as drawing and quartering or something like that, uh, Unless, and, and there's, I should say, there's nothing in the Eighth Amendment that says or it implies or suggests that cruel and unusual punishment simply means a discrete list. So let's say what it originally meant to the people who ratified the Constitution was something like barbaric and inhumane punishments. Let's suppose that that is basically how people understood the words. And that's arguable that that is how they understood the words. Then a conscientious jurist has to, in uh, applying the Eighth Amendment, uh, decide whether, for example, the death penalty is barbaric and inhumane. Well, that is a moral judgment. But a justice that understands the Eighth Amendment, the original meaning, in that way, does not have a choice other than to make a decision about whether it's barbaric and inhumane. 
Now you might say, well, the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, those who wrote the Eighth Amendment or those who wrote it, ratified it didn't think it was barbaric and inhumane. They didn't think it was beyond the pale. They didn't think it was uncivilized. But there's nothing in the Eighth Amendment that says that the government shall not inflict punishments that were thought in uh, 1791 to be barbaric and inhumane. There's nothing in there that says that. And so uh, if, they're going to, if the court is going to apply the Eighth Amendment according to an originalist approach, and the justices assume something like what they meant by cruel and unusual is barbaric and humane, the conscientious judge is going to have to make a moral judgment about whether the death penalty is barbaric and inhumane. Uh, and so they will have to play the role of philosopher kings in this, uh, you know, in this specific sense. Um, so now you can, uh, a defender of originalism, I mean one, uh, you could say, well that's not that's not what the, uh, you, you can argue about the mini meaning of uh, cruel and unusual. You can argue about the meaning of the privileges or immunities clause. You can argue about the meaning of the due process clause. But notice that even on the substantive interpretation that Elon favors, uh, it, it, calls, it, it prohibits states from depriving people of life, liberty, or property without a due process. The notion of due process is not defined. It, and it, it refers to a process that is, in effect, due, appropriate, required, or something like that. So if you're going to try to decide whether the due process has been followed, you have to rely on a moral judgment. There's no, there's no way around that. Okay, so that's, that's my answer to the question of whether originalism uh, entails judicial restraint. It does not. Okay, so then just to the second question, should we uh, accept it? And this I'm going to pick up on something that uh, Clint said and that he, uh, I think, uh, he rightly sees as a worrisome implication of originalism, but one that he is willing to accept because of his commitment to the rule of law as he understands it. Okay, Let's suppose that the court was right in the slaughterhouse cases and the privileges or immunities clause refers only to a discrete set of positive legal rights created by federal law. And that the, let's say that the due process clause refers only to uh, the requirement that certain uh, uh, processes be followed uh, before someone can be executed or imprisoned or have their property confiscated. Uh, and let's suppose that originalism is the correct approach. It follows from that that today in 2022, none of us has a constitutional right to freedom of speech or freedom of religion against state law. Okay, that's an implication of originalism on this factual assumption, which may well be true. Now, I say that's just, that's, I would say that's just plain wrong. Regardless of how the uh, privileges, of, regardless of how the 14th Amendment was originally understood. We now today have constitutional rights against state law to freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Uh, the court would recognize it. Virtually every uh, lawyer would accept that. Most citizens would agree to it. And there's, uh, there's no sort of imaginable scenario in which uh, those rights would not be uh, recognized and protected by the legal system. Uh, and so that just, to me, that just shows originalism cannot be right because originalism implies a falsehood on, the, on an empirical assumption that might well be true. And I'll stop there. Jim, do you mind if I say a few words? And, and, then, and then, I don't, do you, do you mind if we go to Q&A and then, or do you want to comment now? I thought it was being kind of put me. I think we're, I think it'd be good to maybe mix it up, Jim, so we have the audience also participate. So. But I, I do want to say, I, I, to, to take the moderator's prerogative and just respond um, with three thoughts about originalism that, that come from my own research. Um, one having to do with ideological predispositions of the justices and how originalism works. 
Um, I wrote a book called Measuring Judicial Activism. One of the measures that we used empirically was whether or not justice is engaged in activities such as invalidating a statute uh, in ways that are consistent with and, and consistent in every instance or almost every instance with their predispositions, their ideological predispositions. And one thing about originalism I find troubling relative to that particular definition is that I find it hard to understand situations in which a conservative justice using originalism would reach a liberal result. If that, if, so if, if it's restrained us, I'd like to see examples of how it actually restrains a conservative, because I think that's the test. The second, so I, I welcome sort of a response to that from our panelists too. The second thought I had was that I think it's important for us to think not just about how current justices and judges and academics interpret the Constitution now, but what did the framers actually want? Were the framers originalists? I'm not 100% sure they were. I think perhaps the evidence is conflicting on this. But if they weren't originalists, we shouldn't be either, right? If they didn't view the Constitution in this way, then why should we? So I, I do also would welcome response there. And finally, when it comes to originalism, I'm always confused by Brown. You know, at the time Brown uh, was decided, of course, or the 14th Amendment was enacted or promulgated, um, ratified, there were no integrated schools. So I think if you're an originalist, you better figure out a way to get around Brown. Um, otherwise, your perspective and your particular approach is, is, to me, simply, you know, it's not consistent. So that, those are my thoughts about originalism. I, I really do. We have them. another hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I have answers. We can, to all three, I think we can yes. respond. So but, Jim, why don't yeah. you respond uh, to to thoughts, and then if uh, audience uh, members, please go to the mic if you if uh, if you'd like to to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, pressure us to hurry up with uh, our yeah. piece. Uh, but we have, <laughs> have you know, but it's it's only it's only um, seven oh three, so we have time for Q and A. So go ahead, Jim. Well, I uh, I, I was going to say something completely di different, but to respond to the one thing that I, I'll respond to you is I, I, I share your same um, question about uh, the original understanding about uh, uh, Brown. Not only were those uh, uh, segregated schools, but the Congress that passed the 14th Amendment maintained them in Washington, D.C. But, um, uh, and I also uh, uh, agree that uh, it seems that uh, um, the, 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 the um, originalism, as I've seen it practiced, can often be uh, suit the ideological. I mean, what, do, do the justices adopt the originalism because it suits their ideology, or is it the other way around? Uh, and, and there's an inconsistency with the um, with uh, with this um, uh, originalism that uh, supports your your um, the, the data. Take, for instance, uh, Justice Thomas and free speech. Um, Justice Thomas now, because uh, he doesn't like uh, uh, New York Times and Sullivan, he wants that revisited because it, uh, it doesn't, as I said, comport with the original understanding. But he is one of the most fierce um, uh, 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 advocates of commercial speech. And I think he'd have a hard time finding uh, uh, a commercial speech um, uh, uh, as part of the freedom of speech. Uh, Justice Scalia said that uh, he was going to look into it and he was going <laughs> to, never did. And, 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 and Justice uh, uh, Scalia, um, uh, when he um, decided the Smith, the Smith decision that said that the free exercise clause doesn't uh, protect against laws of general ap ap applicability, not a word about the original um, uh, understanding of the free exercise clause because he just doesn't like judicial balancing like that. Now, to be fair to Justice Scalia, as, uh, as Justice Bullock said, he often did do what I, uh, he often did go against his, his, his preferences. And it's easier to see the uh, hypocrisy uh, uh, with someone like Justice Scalia than with Justice Kennedy with all the Constitution means is what he thinks is, you know, it's hard to see inconsistency there. I'll stop. Do you want to take Other it panel? first, or uh, Since, which, which of the again, several? please for those yeah. audience members, if you're eager to ask a question, please go back so we know that you want to ask a question. But in the meantime, let's allow the panelists to continue the dialogue. So, why, why don't yeah. you start? I've got plenty to back you up. Okay. <laughs> um, well, this turned you know like an ambush really quick. No, not an ambush, Michelle coming. Um, but to answer uh, 
these, these questions and criticisms, they have answers. They have answers. They've been developed quite thoroughly in the original literature of the last two, three decades. Um, and so, you know, well, the, so let me just ta tackle them as short, as quickly as I can. So does it restrain conservatives? Well, with all due respect, I think this question stacks the deck against conservatives. I'm, and I'm going to use Roe v. Wade as an example. The liberal progressive result in Roe v. Wade is the Constitution compels the preference of progressive. And the supposedly conservative outcome is that the Constitution doesn't compel a progressive or conservative outcome at all, but rather leaves it to the state to decide. With a democratic process, we the people can decide whether to have abortions or not. That's conservative? That's not conservative at all. The conservative answer is Adrian Vermeule and Hadley Arcus, who want to say uh -huh. that a fetus is a person for, meaning, for the purposes of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, which the original meaning protects against private violence, and therefore an abortion violates the equal protection of the laws clause, because it says no person shall be deprived, um, well, uh, nor shall any person, no, nor shall any state deprive any person within its jurisdiction of equal protection of the laws, okay? And they, they want to say that this means that the 14th Amendment prohibits abortion as a constitutional matter everywhere. And that way, would be this conservative. Is, this is the common good yeah. originalism that I was referring to before. Yeah, I, yeah. That, and I don't speak its name, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Justice Bullock can say as much as he wants. I refuse to acknowledge its existence. So, yes. uh, so, so again, you know, what's, the, what's it just, it's unfair. It just stacks the deck. It's an asymmetry to say that the liberal result is if the Constitution compels progressivism and the con it's conservative to say actually it doesn't. It leaves these questions to the democratic process. So I think, you know, that's, if it, I, I think that's an answer to, to the first question. As, as to the second, were they originalists? Yes, every single one of them. Uh, they were all originalists. David Curry, a famous professor at the University of Chicago, wrote in the Constitution in Congress that you know when they were debating the Constitution in Congress, every single person assumed an originalist framework. Okay, there's this famous article in 1985 by H. Jefferson Powell called The Original Understanding of Original Intent, where he argues that the framers didn't intend for their intentions to govern, and therefore originalism is self-defeating. The problem is, you know, the, the second half of his article, which people seem to forget to read, right, says what did they expect to govern if not their original intent? Well, the original public meaning of the text that they wrote, right? That's what they thought. And so originalism in the 1980s was this sort of, oh, you know, you, you read Ed Meese's famous speech in 1985, it's original intentions, intentions. No, 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 that's not originalism today, right? The secret intent of the founding fathers. The originalists in the 1980s, you know, a little before I was born, they listened to H. Jefferson Powell and said, you know what, you're right, you're right. It is actually original public meaning. Every single argument. James Madison has a letter in 1824 after Noah Webster's dictionary came out. And he said, this is great. What a, what a metamorphosis in law you know, would linguistic drift, I'm paraphrasing, you know, create if we didn't have resort to dictionaries to tell us what the authentic meaning attached at the time was. Right? They were all originalists. Chief Justice Marshall. We must remember it's a constitution we're expounding. He wasn't being a living constitutionalist. He was explaining why the necessary and proper clause was a grant of implied powers. Because it's a constitution we're expounding. If the necessary and proper clause weren't a grant of implied powers, the framers would have had to written it, write out all the implied powers, giving the constitution a prolixity of a legal code. Okay, that's what he was saying. He wasn't saying we're living constitutionalists. And as for Brown v. Board, well, you can buy my new book, The Second Founding, An Introduction to the 14th Amendment. I think it's actually an easy case under the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And I will make one plug. I agree that it would be very awkward for originalists if Brown didn't come out, right? I believe that my theory is the only theory that actually sufficiently accounts for Brown v. Board of Education, which you know, well, if that's the only that theory that, right, if, that's, if there's only one theory out there and it happens to be yours, that's pretty damning, I think, yep. actually. Uh, uh, well, everybody else. Say. <laughs> uh, I have something about consensus and more. Oh, I do want to say one, one, one last thing about what Professor DeMarneff uh, <laughs> said. Um, I don't think, he, 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 he says as though, you know, of course the Constitution isn't self-defining, right? You know, a Martian comes to Earth, reads the Constitution, is like, okay, what is legislative power? I, I don't know, right? Let's see how other people used it. Let's see how other texts use it. Let's see how Locke and Blackstone and the American founders used it, right? Obviously, it doesn't define itself. But to say that because it doesn't define itself means that we only have resort to moral judgments. These aren't collectively exhaustive possibilities. How about we just look at how they used it? Look at texts and documents outside of it, and they tell us how they used the privileges or immunities of citizenship. We have cases where they define the privileges and immunities of citizens. We can look at the 39th Congress. They tell us 
You know, what are the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizens? Uh, uh, Lyman Trumbull was asked in, in the ratification debates. He said, we defined it. We defined it in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the right to contract, to own property, to sue, be parties, give evidence, right? It, so, like, it's, these aren't collectively exhaustive possibilities. There's, there's a way to figure out what the Constitution's words are while recognizing that it, it doesn't just have a dictionary appended to it. To pick up on the, the points that uh, Professor Worman was making, I could not agree more emphatically that constitutions don't define their terms. And if that means that judges are licensed to exercise moral judgment, don't forget, we're licensing William O. Douglas, we're licensing Samuel Alito. Um, you know, they all get to get to do this, which is, you know, I think I think a terrifying uh, thought. And the point of originalism is to figure out what the original meaning of those terms were. And uh, Professor Worman is absolutely correct. I, I, as a student of of the privileges or immunities clause. Um, there are a lot of things that are unclear about the meaning of that clause, but there are certain things that were universally agreed upon, including uh, in both the majority and the dissenting opinions in Slaughterhouse, uh, there was a judicial construct of, of privileges or immunities in a case called Corfield versus Coriel. Everyone agreed that privileges or immunities meant that. Um, the, uh, and, as Professor Worman just mentioned, there was no question that what they were doing was constitutionalizing the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Other things like incorporation and, and, and equal protection and that sort of thing are, are, are less clear, but, but those, things, those things are crystal clear. Um, in terms of judicial restraint, I don't know whether judicial restraint is considered a positive or, or a negative. Um, uh, yes, originalism is a form of judicial restraint if it means not rewriting laws and constitutional provisions or injecting subjective values. No, if it means um, a, a, a refusal to enforce constitutional rights. And I mentioned uh, uh, the Fifth Amendment's takings clause as, uh, as one of, of many examples. Um, and I think, I think that's basically... Um, what I have to say, I'm sure there were some other. Oh, and as far as Brown versus Board goes, I I, uh, I don't know whether I share uh, Professor Worman's view, but as a as a textualist originalist, the uh, the framers agreed only on one thing, and that was the language of the Fourteenth Amendment. That's what we ought to be looking at, not their intent, not their actions. This is why I have a concern with history and traditions, because a lot of times the framers, uh, including the 14th Amendment, appealed to their higher angels. Um, the Declaration of Independence, exactly the same thing. Um, and so we enforce not their intent, not the history and traditions that existed at that time, but the meaning of the words um, that, uh, that, uh, that they uh, agreed to in our organic law. If I might say, that sounds something like Jim's uh, point about the purpose of the First Amendment um, and advancing that purpose. We can all be friends. Yes. Okay, good, good, yes. Good. yes. <laughs> oh, it looks like we have someone asked a question, so that's great. Go ahead. I just to say, <clears throat> introduce sorry. yourself, though. Hi, my name is uh, Felix, and uh, I just want to thank you all for uh, having this discussion. It's been very interesting. I would like to ask the question to all the panelists of how does your view of the uh, how does your interpretation of the Constitution serve the American people and advance the values of democracy? And are these matters important when weighing judicial outcomes? Who goes first? <laughs> it's a great, a great question. A great a question. Um, it's the background, as I said, of the of, of, of our entire Constitution is representative democracy, such that some countries that don't have an express uh, guarantee of free speech, uh, infer it. So, um, and there's a wonderful book that I really enjoy by John Hart, uh, Ely, Democracy and Distrust, points out that some constitutional provisions reinforce democracy, like free speech, others um, uh, don't, and, uh, and he had a particular, as I do, 
uh, particular uh, dislike for substantive uh, uh, due process uh, because, uh, uh, and particularly, and he actually had a lot of problems, even though he was a liberal who supported abortion rights, he had a very um, a, a big problem with Roe because he thought it without uh, a, a, a sufficient warrant gave um, uh, the, the judiciary had seized uh, on, a, on a way to stop the democratic process to uh, basically um, um, uh, impose their view on a, a, a good public policy, one to which he agreed. So it's a very difficult and important question that you ask. Anyone else? I mean, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add one thing, is I'll challenge the premise a little bit, uh, which is I don't necessarily think the Constitution's only objective, and I didn't get into this, this was the part I left out, uh, is democracy, self-government, right? It's a balance between self-government and liberty. And of course, a lot of the things that we, we insulate from the democratic process, it's believed that in the long term, by doing so, we're actually making democracy safer, right? Democracy won't necessarily last very long. If people couldn't defend themselves, you know, uh, if people, uh, if the government could just arrest you without cause, without established law, if they could rifle through your papers without probable cause, I mean, right, these are, if free speech could be uh, uh, punished and so on. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a balance, right? It's, it's, we get out of this thing called the state of nature, okay, so because, and into this thing called civil society, uh, because the state of nature, this, you know, state of perfect freedom and equality has its defects, and we want civil society to remedy those defects. If civil society just took away all the freedoms that we had, it would be a pretty raw deal, right? So it's not just democracy, it's also self-government, uh, it's also liberty. And, I'd like to just, I'll paraphrase, uh, it's not an exact quote, so I'll say let's paraphrase, but it's close. I think Edmund Burke has a really nice saying, phrase uh, that he uses in um, his Reflections on a Revolution in France, and it goes mostly like this. This is almost accurate, paraphrase, okay. To form a government requires no great prudence. Settle the seat of power, compel obedience, and the work is done. To create freedom is easier still. It is not necessary to guide. It only requires to let go the reins. But to form a free government, that is a government or constitution that tempers together these competing objectives of liberty and restraint in one consistent work requires a sagacious, powerful, and combining mind. So it's both. And I would argue that our constitution, that the framers were remarkably successful for their time, and they wrote a constitution that continues to be successful. Now, it's easier to say it today because we live under the second founding, not the first founding. We've remedied a lot of the central defects. Um, but that's, in, in a nutshell, why I think it's actually worth following today. Just to be really clear, I never said that the constitution was only about democracy. That was challenging. We, we, his premise. We're, we're a, and I didn't hear you to say that. I, maybe you did. It's a liberal democracy. My point is that the rights are the, the ones that judges should be enforcing are the ones that are spelled out, not the ones they want to create uh, under some oxymoron. You're here. Uh, just a, a follow up. Uh, Professor Warman did not use a single note when uh, giving that incredibly eloquent quote. I am very impressed. But, you might um, want to double check it's actually accurate. But, well, you know, I, I trust you. I trust you. It, and, and if it wasn't, it was an improvement on the original. Uh, so. <laughs> um, but to your, to your question, um, our independent judiciary is one of the absolute gems of, of our American exceptionalism. When we compare to the Chinese Supreme Court where the Chief Justice said that the purpose of the judiciary is to perpetuate the regime, you know, obviously that could not be more different than here. And I'll just point to one specific concrete example of how judicial independence and, and fidelity to the rule of law really matters, and that was the 2000 election, where the court in what really was a very weak <laughs> decision from a jurisprudential standpoint, and was so, so dubious that the court announced that it was good for that day only and never to be cited again, uh, pronounced the, the candidate who won fewer popular votes to be the President of the United States and Al Gore accepted that. Think about any other country where the person who received fewer popular votes was anointed president by the judiciary. 
we would see a freaking revolution. But pretty much after a few protests, now obviously fast forward to 2022, I don't know whether that would happen the same way again, but that just shows that, uh, you know, I, I think that's the, the strongest example of how this institution properly, um, properly performed uh, really, really does enhance enhance and protect democracy. Yeah, it's a shining a moment question. for Al Gore. Not so it shining sure, a moment for the U.S. Supreme Court, I would say. <laughs> it surely was a shining yes. moment, and I wish his lesson were yes, followed, followed by other absolutely. politicians. Do we have another question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. Aiden, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Aiden. I'm a tool here at the law school. Uh, first of all, thank you all. This has been a fascinating and, uh, and spirited uh, discussion. Uh, my question is actually for Justice Bullock. Um, you made a passing reference to uh, the linguistic tool of corpus linguistics uh, during your initial uh, speech. And I, I wanted to know, I guess, I guess I have two questions. One, has, it, has, has the Arizona Supreme Court made use of corpus linguistics yet? And if not, um, what do you see as sort of the future of this, this technology or this method in uh, advancing, or I guess proposing uh, solutions to some of the practical problems of uh, originalism? So um, that's a, a really great question. Um, and I, I was talking to a lawyer last night who's a member of the LDS church, and he had never heard about this. And he says, this is awesome. I can use this to interpret religious texts from the 1800s. I, it's got uses that, you know, that uh, I hadn't even thought about. But um, litigants have not used it or presented it to us as yet, which I, I find uh, unfortunate. Um, we have not yet formally adopted it, though I am uh, a, a very strong proponent of it. Um, a number of other courts have adopted it um, to define terms. Like one, one of my favorite terms is a lot of old criminal laws use the term annoying as, as a crime. And I'm like, oh, my God, my kids violate the law every single day, right? <laughs> obviously, yes, yes, obviously annoying meant something different in, in, in when the statutes were, were written uh, than, uh, than it does now. Um, so I just think it is, it is a very neutral tool. Um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't yield a dispositive result. Um, we, I have used it in, in my chambers to to you know to inform myself or to to either support or or detract from a uh, from a concept but i just think it makes an originalist job a lot easier to see what normal everyday people were how they were using a, a, a term and i suspect just to get give an example i suspect if we did it corpus linguistics research on privileges or immunities <laughs> in in the early 1870s we would find a very, very strong uh, consensus around, around what that, those terms meant, even among the, the, the ordinary populace. You know, for those law students out there looking for an interesting paper topic, this is a cool paper topic. Oh, it, it, it absolutely is. Yeah. Go ahead. Next question. Hi, my name is Robert. I'm a 1L here at the law school. My question is, if we took for the sake of argument that Brown and originalism are not compatible, would it really be fair to blame that on originalism, or would we say the Constitution is defective? Thank you. I guess that's to us, or? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's a great question, and, and I would say, um, again, it goes to this, this issue of, you know, I don't think that, the fact that Brown is, comes out, if, if Brown comes out wrong in this hypothetical, it doesn't change the Constitution's meaning, okay? It could be that that makes the Constitution so unjust Okay. And but yet for some reason we haven't amended it, so it's a bit weird of a hypothetical, okay? Um, because obviously our modern day sensibilities have, you know, and we've carried the Constitution along with us uh, in many ways. Uh, but if if that decision, you know, were so central to this idea that the Constitution succeeds at what it's supposed to succeed at, this balancing of self government and liberty, um, you know, like imagine with our modern day sensibilities if there was still slavery under the Constitution, right? I don't think that changes what the Constitution means. It changes the calculus of whether we should follow that or follow something else. And that something else could be 
you know, changing the Constitution through an amendment, or it could be, you know, we've just accepted as a matter of social fact that judges have changed the meaning and content of the Constitution over time, uh, come up with new constitutional rules. But to be clear, that doesn't make that system an interpretive system, right? It makes it a, a system of constitutional change and constitutional modification, and we just accept that that's the constitutional system we have, right? I, but that doesn't make that kind of non-originalism an interpretive theory. It makes it a theory of constitutional change. I think the question um, points out um, something that's been immanent in this whole discussion about what level of specificity we're asking about the originalism. If we're asking about does the understanding of the term equal protection of the laws, did that understanding go to the specific practice of segregated schools, then it's hard to say that, that, that it didn't uh, um, um, think that segregated schools was okay. If, as I tried to do with the First Amendment, to say you're looking for the, uh, for the core value, um, and that's um, the quality of, 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 of sort of an anti-subordination, uh, that you don't have pariah class uh, as you know, as Justice Harlan said in in in, in Plessy versus uh, Ferguson, we don't have pariah classes in this country. Uh, that that was the value. That you don't get to take a group, particularly the recently uh, uh, freed slaves, and and, and 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 subject them, make them second class citizens. Uh, then uh, you could say uh, at the time Brown was de decided that we understand that um, that practice, as it works today, uh, segregated schools, as the court said, is a, a way of oppressing the, uh, of the, the very group that the 14th Amendment was particularly trying to help. It may not have been then, when you had free slaves uh, uh, and, and children of free slaves. It might not have, segregated schools may not have been particularly unequal at the time in the core sense of what that amendment was after. I, I would say, um, where was the student who just asked? Ah, there we go. If you ask questions that good, please take my survey of individual rights class uh, as a 2L or 3L, because I'd, I'd love to have uh, great questions like that. But I, I would say that uh, if it was inconsistent with originalism, then Brown should turn out differently. Um, and one of the things uh, about decisions like that is that they can often drive political change. Um, and a classic example of that was a case I obliquely referred to, Kelo versus City of New London, where the court um, interpreted the takings clause to be public benefit rather than public use. And the outrage over that decision, which was in that case a very non-originalist <laughs> decision, um, uh, was so great that a whole host of states, either their courts interpreted their public use provision in a, in a much narrower way, or they passed laws. Arizona did both. They passed a law and <laughs> interpreted our eminent domain pr provision much more restrictively. So sometimes uh, uh, um, an adverse decision uh, can be exactly what you need. And, uh, and uh, that I think, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to get into this case very much, but that I think is what um, pro-choice activists are seeing right now. And we're seeing uh, a real strong uh, popular legislative uh, uh, reaction. And I'm not saying that that decision was was wrong or right, but but the perception among many people that it was wrong. I see there's a gentleman in the back ready to ask a question. I'm so sorry to do this, and I hope you'll come up and ask the panelists, but it's 7.30, and I think I promised everyone that we'd wrap by now, so I do apologize to you, and hope you'll talk to us afterward. Um, I want to thank our panelists for a very lively discussion, for incredibly interesting points that you made. Thank you to the audience for being here, for joining us at the Center for Constitutional Design. I must thank Carol McNamara, who's a senior director wherever she is. She's, there she is, and Jay Jenkins, and Isis Gutierrez, and the folks from PBS who are here, and um, Tabs, who's taking photographs, and everyone else. Thank you for support for this event. And we look forward to seeing you at future Center for Constitutional Design events. Again, there's one on elections and federalism, October 7th and 8th. It will prove to be very interesting with some excellent experts here to talk to us about
what it means to have a federal system of elections managed at the state level in the United States. So I do encourage you to come to that, and, um, and thank you for being here. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Four will be Professor Sweeney, two hours.